Um, I appreciate you taking the time to hear an update on the emission estimation methods we're developing for animal feeding operations. And for simplicity, I will call them models for the balance of this presentation since emission estimation methodology is a bit of a mouthful. Um, and so for today's talk, um, just to give you, there we go, um, a quick, I'm gonna give you a quick refresher on the history of how all of this started and just remind you what draft materials are available now if you're interested in looking at a few things before we go into our formal public comment period. And then talk about the model development process um, as it's laid out in our documents and how um, um, it's been improved before our next release, which will be part of our uh, formal public comment process. And then we'll get into how the review will actually happen and how you can provide comments. Because um, uh, we really are interested in getting comments from you, our stakeholders. And I'll provide a quick look at the web tool we've been developing to run all the calculations. We've been promising it for a long time. We think we've hit our TurboTax-like promise that we've had for the last few years. Um, and then finally, I'll wrap up with a few reminders on the uses and limitations of the draft models before we open it up to questions. With that, let's get going. So um, if you're new to <laughs> names, um, and the uh, saga of EPA trying to develop uh, air emission methodologies for or models for um, animal feeding operations. All this actually started way back before 2001 when we developed a draft report entitled Emissions from Animal Feeding Operations. Um, the objectives of that investigation were to characterize the magnitude of emissions from different livestock operations and assess the value of the currently available information to support future air pollution policy decisions regarding AFODs and identify areas where targeted research was necessary. And this draft report is currently what's posted on our AP42 website um, as a placeholder for um, our emission, uh, or emission models. So then in 2001, um, in a joint effort between EPA and USDA, we requested that the National Academy of Sciences or NAS evaluate the body of scientific information used for estimating various kinds of air emissions from AFOs, as well as this 2001 report from EPA. In 2002, uh, the National Academy of Science released an interim report entitled The Scientific Basis for Estimating Air Emissions from Animal Feeding Operations Interim Report, which is available in the AP42 chapter um, website if you're interested, and also on the National Academy site. Um, this report was not a favorable review of our 2001 draft report. Um, so spurred by kind of the uncertainty about emission levels from AFOs, concerns about applicability of the Clean Air Act requirements for AFOs, representatives of the pork um, industry, egg producers, and other AFO sectors uh, proposed a plan to us at EPA to produce emission estimation monitoring data from um, AFOs, which was the beginnings of the air consent agreement. By 2003, the National Academy of Science released its final report calling on EPA to develop scientifically credible methodologies for estimating emissions from AFOs. Um, and they speci specifically, they thought that should be, this should be done through process-based um, models. Um, at the same time, the consent decree ne negotiations continued. And by 2005, we had the voluntary air consent agreement um, published and that laid out the framework for the National Air Emissions Monitoring Study, or NAMES, which we'll talk about in just a couple of slides. Um, for a little more detail on the consent agreement itself, the overall goals of the agreement were to reduce air pollution, to monitor uh, emissions from animal feeding operations, and also promote a national consensus on the emission models that should be used for animal feeding operations. And finally, um, it was to ensure compliance with the requirements of the Clean Air Act and also um, certain reporting requirements under, these are mouthfuls and I'm sorry, the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act or CERCLA and the Emergency Planning Community Right to Know Act or EPCRA. And since the inception of the agreement, animal feeding operations were exempted from reporting under both EPCRA and CERCLA. Um, EPCRA reporting was eliminated by a rulemaking and EPA is currently revisiting that decision and recently published an advance notice of proposed rulemaking on the topic. They are still collecting comments on that until February 15th. If you're interested, I'll try to um, drop the link in the chat um, once we get to the end in case you want to go and look at that in a little more detail. Um, the EPA, um, over the course of this, again, we work with environmental, uh, both Industry representatives, and I think I just went back a slide, sorry. 
Um, we worked with industry representatives, state and local governments, and environmental groups and other stakeholders as we developed the voluntary consent agreement. And this resulted in us approving approximately 2,600 agreements, which represented nearly 14,000 participating facilities. Um, the agreements were kind of collected under um, larger parent organizations. So some of the big producers, when they signed up, it counted as one agreement, but they represented multiple farms. Um, all the participating animal feeding operations paid a civil penalty, and that was between $200,000 and $100,000. And that was the amount of the penalty was based on the size and the number of um, operations covered by their agreement. Uh, the participants were also responsible for contributing to a fund to cover the cost of the monitoring study, which I keep teasing and we'll talk about, I promise. Um, and as part of the agreement, EPA itself uh, agreed not to pursue participating animal feeding operations for certain um, past and ongoing violations of the Clean Air Act, CERCLA or EPRA, provided those um, operations were complying with the agreement conditions. And just to clarify, the agreement doesn't limit EPA's ability to take action in the event of an imminent and substantial threat to public health and the, or the environment. And it also um, preserves state and local authorities' ability to enforce any local um, ordinance law and odor or any nuisance laws. And once the EPA publishes final emission models for any one of the animal sectors, the participants must apply the final models to determine what actions, if any, they need to take to comply with any applicable Clean Air Act requirements. Um, so that's the nitty gritty of the agreement, but in that we also have um, it set up the NAMES or the National Air Emission Monitoring Study, um, which was a two-year industry-funded uh, study, again resulting from the compliance agreement. There were 25 sites monitored um, during the course of the study, and this included um, uh, confinement sites, so houses and barns, as well as open source sites or lagoons and basins. Um, we monitored for hydrogen sulfide, ammonia, three different size uh, constituents of PM, so TSP, PM10, and two and a half, and VOCs. Um, the study did include swine, dairy, egg layers, and broiler farms. Beef, cattle, and turkeys were not included in the study. Um, and then the sites were selected based on representation of the industry at the time. So the sites that were selected were participants in the air consent agreement and represented um, the standard operating practices of um, that animal sector at that time. Um, and then it also provided, we selected based on a diversity of geographic locations. We wanted to make sure the sites were kind of spread out across the U.S. and represented different climatological regions as well. Um, the map over here kind of shows where everything's laid out. This um, image is also on our project website. Um, I think the links were in the flyer. Um, if you want to look at it a little closer, um, but um, some states have representation across different animal types. Um, the easiest one to see here is Indiana, where there were two different swine facilities, so an open source or a lagoon site and a barn site. Um, same with dairy, where there's a lagoon and a barn site, so that's what the two is for. And then there was also a layer site in Indiana that was studied over the cross, um, the name study. Um, <clears throat> so, the impetus for everything kind of started back in 2001. Uh, we received the data in 2007. So this has been going on for a little while, but we're in the home stretch. I'm very excited about it. Um, and we have been releasing draft reports. Um, released the swine report in a initial swine report in August of 2020. Um, and then each year we released another animal type um, after that. And I want to emphasize these are draft reports. Um, We've been kind of liking them to progress reports, just to kind of let know, let everyone know what we were thinking and kind of where things were heading and how things were progressing, trying to have a very transparent process with all of this. And we solicited feedback on all of those preliminary reports as well. Um, received comments from several entities, including USDA, whose um, review we specifically sought out on all those reports. And we've taken all this feedback in and we're using it now to, um, and over this past year, to improve the models and improve these reports for what's coming up. Um, if you haven't been following too closely, um, this is what part of our project website looks like. The um, link is down here at the bottom, um, but we have the different animal type reports. Um, we have uh, one report for swine and that includes all the housing types plus open sources. Um, we also have um, egg layers for all the different, all the, um, different housing types and uh, manure shed sources in there. There's a separate report for broilers and then a separate report for all the dairy types. 
um, that we've kind of lumped in together. And then there's a report um, summarizing our VOC data. Um, the image on the right is just kind of an image of what the site looks like, so you know you, you've got there. Um, and it also includes the project quap um, and the reports that we initially released to the SAB back in 2012, if you're interested in seeing how everything's evolved. Um, I do want to reiterate right now that all these models are draft and are subject to change, and they change before um, our final um, submittal for the public, the formal public review process. Um, one other note about the reports, kind of this is part of how things have evolved over um, the course of all of our work. Um, we've restructured the reports since the swine report. So starting with the um, poultry reports, the layer and uh, broiler reports, we've actually split off the material that applies all to all the animal types into what we're calling the process overview or all sectors report. Um, these items are background information on the consent agreement names, um, a summary of all the data that was collected, and just kind of a lot of overview of the modeling process itself. So if that's what you really wanna comment on or focus on, all that's contained in one report. So it's very easy to get at. Um, it also prevents all the information from being repeated in every report, which streamlines the individual animal reports. Um, and the swine report is quite large. I had problems putting it in a PDF. So this has been beneficial to everyone involved um, to, to really help people get at um, what they really wanna review for anything. Um, again. Each animal type has um, their specific information appears in their own reports. Um, so this will contain things like the literature review, the exploratory data analysis, and any specific details on the model development process specific to that animal type. So again, all the egg layer information is in a separate report, all the broiler information is in its own report. So that way, if you're only interested in one single animal type, you don't have to wade through all the animal types that we're presenting here um, to get at the information you really want. Um, and we are going to reformat the swine report so it's more streamlined and matches all of this um, for our submittal for our draft AP42 chapter. Um, so to kind of go into a little bit of what the reports cover and kind of give you a quick overview of the model development process. Um, it has been fairly consistent over the whole um, process and at its simplest, it uh, consists of five steps. First, we select parameters to include which leaned heavily on the relationships from literature and the exploratory data analysis um, of the names data itself. So we're kind of looking at what trends were present in the names data and um, what would keep um, parameters identified in literature for these processes. Um, our final selection of parameters to include also consider data quantity. So that is if we had a lot of observations under different conditions, as well as potential ease of measurement for a producer. That is whether a parameter was something the producer already collected or could easily get in order to um, use these models. And once we settled on the parameters to include, we created daily emission models to test based on the various combinations of those identified parameters. So for example, if we identify temperature and relative humidity, we would actually run three models. We run temperature separately, uh, a model with relative humidity separately, and then we'll one with both of those combined. And this allowed us to kind of look at um, the prediction quality of each one of those values uh, parameters separately, as well as combined to make sure that we were um, not adding in parameters just for the sake of having a lot of parameters. If you study a lot of stats, you know that if you throw a lot of st uh, parameters into a model, um, sometimes you'll get better model performance than what you're actually doing because you're overtuning the model. And so it was. this was a way that we could look at it individually since we knew uh, these parameters based on literature and the data should be contributing to the emissions at the site. Um, we selected one of those models um, to further pursue based on an evaluation of accuracy and again, the ease of use of the models. Um, the selected model was then subjected to more testing. This is our jackknife testing that we talk about in our reports. And if you've ever heard me talk before, you've probably heard me go on about for a second. Um, and basically the jackknife testing is where one unit is removed from the data set. So either one barn or house or one lagoon is removed and then we reprocess the model. And this is a way for us to check to see if the model changes drastically um, to ensure that a single site isn't driving uh, the trends that the model's capturing. So um, if the coefficients change greatly when we remove um, one layer site or one house out of the data set, then it would suggest that there's another parameter that needs to be included in the model 
that um, is driving the emissions at that site that had been removed. And finally, uh, we developed annual emission estimates and estimates of uncertainty for our models at the end of the process. Um, so just to talk about parameters for just a second, um, this is a refresher of the parameters available for us for model development. The table notes parameters that we have at the same interval as the emission data. That is, there were either already daily values or hourly values we could roll up to daily values. Um, we do have some limited biomaterial data, that is samples of manure and feed that were analyzed for nitrogen content. However, it's neither at a refined temporal resolution or it's neither consistent at um, across all the sites. So I think the original plan for the study was to collect samples um, at least once every quarter. Um, some sites did that, some sites just because of scheduling. The, they did two different samples in a quarter for the last year of the study. Um, so it's not, uh, again, very consistent from site to site um, to the point where um, it lacked that temporal refinement that made it to incorporate it into the models at this time. Um, we um, did use that data. Um, ORD did some nitrogen mass balance with that data just to make sure that the monitored values were kind of checking out and that we weren't producing uh, or rather the monitored data was not um, recording more nitrogen that should be coming into the system. So it was used, um, it just wasn't incorporated into the models at this time. Um, we also looked at adding descriptive parameters like the manure, the man manure management system. And we also added um, what I will call a developed parameter um, like cycle day. And that's just an indication of how long animals and manure had been in the barn. And we based this off of the inventory values that were reported. Um, cycle day was used because it has a link to some of the management activities that change during the growing cycles, um, like feed changes that we didn't necessarily have specific data for, for the sites in the study. And as we progressed through the animal types, we also added additional parameters for testing and alternative formulations. Um, like predicting, predicting emissions on a per head basis as opposed to a total daily emission basis. Um, and that's what we refer to as the normalized models um, in that last bullet. Um, with the review and revisions um, that we've been doing over this past year, we looked at whether any of the new parameters or techniques should be applied to models that were developed prior to us testing them out. So for example, the normalized models um, really came into play with dairy um, as it's a very stable um, population within the barns. Um, so we've been reviewing um, uh, normalized models for other animal types like layers where again, the population is fairly consistent um, across the entire study. Our review over the past year also included some tweaks, exploratory data analysis phase, uh, which informed the selection phase, which would be um, after these parameters. Um, the report now includes uh, or will provide statistics, summary statistics and plots on a per head basis. Um, and we're also applying a consistent excessive negative removal process to the data sets. If you've been following along with the study, this was introduced, um, I can't remember exactly, but somewhere in the layer and broiler um, reports where um, in an effort to consistently remove negative outliers from the data set, um, we came up with a process and that's outlined in the report um, to remove anything that was excessive um, as you can get some negative values just um, based on how the calculations are set up and then calibration drift within the monitors themselves. And this was um, a result of, or rather in response to some of the comments we received from the SAB as far as how to filter that data out. And what we've done now is gone back through all the animals um, and applied that consistent removal process and um, reprocessed all the plots for the report. Um, and so this kind of gets us to the end half of the process where we're actually developing the models um, for those who are very interested. It's a linear model, specifically a linear mixed effects model with a repeated variant spatial power covariance structure. All this is described in the report. Um, basically, it's a covariant structure that works really well when time intervals are not evenly spaced, um, like we had with the lagoon sites, um, where it was monitored two weeks out of a quarter, and then um, they wouldn't come back for until the next quarter and do two weeks, so that we didn't have that same uh, temporal consistency. We performed a natural log transformation on all the emissions, 
and use that transformed value for model development, except for particulate matter models for broilers. And that was for all three size fractions of PM for broilers, PM10, 2.5, and TSP. Um, our colleagues in ORD have been um, reviewing other models to see if the model performance would benefit from a similar approach. Um, excuse me. Um, this is kind of a, another great example of the type of discovering and tweaks to the approach that um, we've been trying to apply over this past year that might benefit other animal types that we kind of discovered later in the process. Um, and some of those changes will be represented in the reports. Um, and then again, we evaluated models uh, based on the performance. So typical model performance statistics like mean error, mean bias, and then again, on their ease of use with respect to the availability um, of those parameters. Um, final testing on the model has also evolved over the reports. Um, all final reports will have the same analysis for model limitations. We've done some more robust testing on the final model that we select, um, just kind of make sure we're not having, or at least defining any kind of extrapolation errors we might be having with the models themselves. Okay, so next steps, let me take a drink. We've come to what's happening onward from here. So in 2024, in the future, um, and that's where we're going to get into our formal public comment period for these. So I guess that we've been reviewing um, all of our informal comments we received and refining the process and kind of recalculating the models and tweaking and trying to make the reports better and easier for everybody. Um, and I've given you a little teaser of some of those changes. Um, so heading into 2024, we're gearing up for our official comment period, which will be happening soon, like February soon. I'm hoping to get it out um, before the end of February. Um, and what we'll do now is we'll just, um, uh, and then, yeah, so for th this half of the presentation, we'll talk about how that process is going to work, which kind of give you, um, a sample of what's going to happen kind of broadly over the next, um, year and maybe into the future, um, is what, after we collect all the responses from that public comment period, we'll review and incorporate those comments into the report and the AP42 chapter, um, kind of this late spring and then into summer. And what we're hoping to do is have a final chapter out by the end of the summer this year. Um, you will notice there's another dot on this timeline that goes past 2024. Um, we're gonna continue to work on this and further refine these models. This is not the end of, of all of this. Um, you, you may hear from me again on this topic um, in years to come. Uh, but we're going to um, try to expand this effort to cover operations not covered in names um, like cage-free layer houses. Um, there was not a specific cage-free house studied um, under names, but to try to expand and then again um, improve these models as we can and maybe try to get them, keep stepping them closer to process-based models. So how is the review process going to work? Um, we're going to use our standard um, emission factor review process or the AP42 review process. Um, everything will be posted to the EPA's AP42 site. The current page is to the right over here. Um, there'll be an alert that's very similar to this box um, that'll say that this new chapter, um, chapter 9.4, is available for review. Um, and I'll have all the links to all the materials and again, how you can comment. Um, we will have a direct link to all that material. Um, on the AP42 site from our project site, um, which is listed right here. I'll drop some of these again in the chat later if they haven't been already. Um, and we're gonna, we have a communications plan with anything we release. And so we'll have some broadcast emails that we'll send out um, to our national industry representatives. Um, so like people um, like on the National Egg Board and such, um, as well as our state contacts and our regional ag advisors and our regional ag advisor will then forward them out to their local um, contacts in the different regions. So we'll have that as a mechanism. We'll also have an announcement that we'll push out on the Agricultural News Center, which has a listserv if you're interested in signing up so you can get it, um, an announcement that way um, when it hits. And then the chief listserv will also send out an email. So if you want to sign up for that, you'll get an email as soon as it hits the page. It's also a very low volume listserv if you're interested, if you want to join the chief listserv, um, so you're not going to get a lot of spam or a lot of email from that system um, if that's the way you want to receive the notice. Um, we It will be at a minimum a 60-day review period. 
We will make it clear in any emails um, when the last date to submit comments will be very similar to kind of what they have in their alert now. We'll have a very specific date and we won't just say X many days. Um, and then all the comments will be submitted via email through the chief um, or AP42 group. And that email is provided here. It'll be EF comments at epi.gov. Don't send them comments just yet. Um, <laughs> and um, yeah, and it'll be a very easy process. They'll kind of come um, collect everything for us and kind of ship them all to us at one time. Um, so that way we can process all the comments and make um, any edits and revisions. So what will be available for review? Um, you'll have an AP42 chapter 9.4, draft version of that. Um, if you're not familiar with the AP42, um, it'll be basically an executive summary of all the technical supporting documents. It'll have a summary of the industry, the pollutants and how they're formed within that, within for animal feeding operations rather. Um, and then it'll have the um, models themselves. Um, and then the, all the new technical supporting documents will be available. So this is that revised overview report. So if you're just really interested in kind of reviewing our statistical process and making comments, you can just refer to that report. Um, and then all the individual animal specific reports if you wanna burrow down into the details for any specific animal type. Um, and see if there are any exceptions to the process. Um, and then hopefully the web tool, um, if the web tool is not available during the formal public comment period, what we'll do is we'll have a separate comment period and beta testing period for the tool um, after that. Um, programming is programming and we're trying to get some really cool things done. So again, it's very um, low impact, if you will, <laughs> tool for everyone to use. And I'm really excited because I can show you a little bit of it now. I've um, got some screenshots. Um, and I just realized that was still there, sorry, um, of the tool. Um, so users will have to supply farm level information for the tool. So things like the farm's location um, and process-based information. So things like the number of animals, um, the animal weights and other kind of basics things as inputs to the tool. Meteorological data like temperature um, is built into the tool. So you don't have to worry about trying to pull that data from anywhere. It's all going to be packed into the tool and it's going to be pulled based on the location you specify for your farm. Um, and that's just going to help keep everything really easy for everybody. This is what the general first input screen looks like. Again, it's very TurboTax like where you kind of walk it through with very basic information. Each screen is kind of a different piece or level of that information um, that we're asking people to input so they can get their numbers. Um, again, it's just uh, basic um, location information that'll again be used to pull um, the MET data. And um, you'll select your animal type on that previous screen as well. And based on that selection, you'll have a couple different, um, or rather entry boxes for all the different source types um, that we have models for, for that. So like for the swine operation process, we'll have, um, entry um, spots for the fairing barns, the gestation barns, um, that's really with an unspecified type of manure pit, um, shallow pit, deep pit, and then also spaces to put in information about any lagoons that are with the farm. And again, it's gonna be really basic information as far as a way for you to put in a barn ID. So that way at the end we'll have inputs where you can see the emissions on a per unit basis, as well as a farm total basis, kind of helps with QA, um, just you make sure that everything seems um, up and up with the calculations. Um, you'll have some, we're still refining this screen a little bit, but um, the information, as far as the information you need to input, you might need to, especially for growing animals, input a beginning weight and ending weight, and then um, the number of animals in the barn. We are allowing for the calculation of um, instances where there are no animals in the barn. Um, so, we know that, especially with growing um, operations, there are some times when the barn is empty. Um, we will account for that in the calculations. Um, so you can just enter in the number of days per year that um, you typically do not have animals in the barn. Um, so if you have, uh, I won't get into the details, but basically it's just the total across the year. So if there's 30 days across the year where you don't have animals in the barn, we'll distribute those across the year in between the cycles. Um, to kind of replicate that in the calculations. And you'll be able to add multiple barns um, and then remove them if need be, if you kind of enter one um, um, prematurely or you enter the wrong type. Um, after that, there's a submit button at the bottom. It'll get you to a confirmation screen um, where you can look over all of your information. You have the opportunity still to remove a site 
or add some additional barns. So you can still make some tweaks and make some tweaks to the data if something doesn't look right um, or you put in an extra zero, that happens. And the final screen will provide a summary of all the results. Um, it will have, um, I don't have any results here, I apologize, um, a range of the meteorological parameters. So there'll be a indication of what the max temperature um, the, was used in the calculation. So if temperature range from zero to 25 degrees C, it'll show up there. So you know, if you've got um, data from a year, maybe where it was excessively cold, and a lot of snow was on the ground, like right now, or a really hot year, you'll have kind of that, um, you'll know what the breadth of uh, and range of data was. Um, <clears throat> again, you'll have an annual summary of emissions total. And again, we have that process ID, which is the barn ID. So you'll be able to see emission totals um, on a per unit basis as well. Like I said, it's kind of nice to see. Um, just make sure if you've got one barn that's a little higher than the others, you can go and double check what those inputs were to make sure they were input correctly. Um, the tool will also provide an estimate of uncertainty associated with mission tools. That's that percent uncertainty box right beside there to kind of give you an indication of the confidence in that estimate or how far it can range from there. Okay. I had to take a drink before I hit my disclaimers. Um, so with respect to the model um, and the application of the models, we just wanna remind people that these are estimates of emissions um, from animal um, confinement and manure storage sources. Um, the air compliance agreement participants must use these final models to determine whether their emissions trigger certain Clean Air Act permitting requirements. Other animal feeding operations may opt to use these final models to determine whether they trigger any Clean Air Act permitting requirements. Um, the final models may also be used for general estimates of emissions from operations across the U.S. or comparisons between operations in different regions. And that's just to say, we believe there's a, um, these models could be used for inventory purposes um, or just comparisons between sites to see um, how climate might affect them. Um, the current draft model should not be used for these purposes. And you should only use the final models for these purposes. We're still tweaking everything. Things will change. They've not gotten the official um, seal of approval and been through all the review process. So please don't use them for that just yet. That said, when we release the tool or in the models come out with the public comment period, if you want to run some calculations just to see kind of ballpark where you are, um, that's what it'll be. It'll just be a ballpark estimate um, if you're an operator to see where your facility lands or if you want to test it to see how it's reacting. Um, that's fine, but they shouldn't be used for those official purposes just yet. Um, so a couple more limitations to these models. The models do not estimate emissions from all pollutants or all emission sources found on animal feeding operations. There are, we at EPA are very well aware that they are more than just ammonia, hydrogen sulfide, PM, and VOC emissions from farms, but that's what the study focused on, and that's what these models um, focus on. Um, they only cover emissions from the barns um, or houses and lagoons and basins. So equipment such as boilers, generators, and farm vehicles are not included in these emission, esti emission estimates and might be required in determining your applicability to permitting thresholds. And some of that will vary based on your locality. So you will need to consult with your local permitting authority to understand any specific state or local regulations that affect those permitting calculations. Um, for example, just really quickly, um, some different uh, municipalities have different thresholds on say the horsepower of engines that need to be included in your um, permitting calculations. So below a certain horsepower level, they don't need to be included, those emissions. Um, and again, that varies widely across the country. Um, so just check in um, if you know, do the initial calculations and you know you're approaching that um, permitting threshold, it might be um, a good reason to check in with your local permitting um, authority just to check to see what else might need to go into your emissions total. Um, these models also do not incorporate all the site-specific management factors that can affect emissions. Um, the models cannot be used to quantify the impacts of any best management practices on emissions. And that just means that these models estimate uncontrolled emissions and the typical management practices employed at the time of data collection. Um, if you would like to take, if any operator would like to take credit for emission reductions due to best management practices or controls for any potential permitting, they will need to discuss that process or discuss that with 
their local permitting authority. Um, we do this with any other stationary source where if um, you have a control, if you have the proper documentation that says this control should reduce my emissions of this pollutant by this percentage, um, they can apply it. And again, it's going to vary by local permitting authority. Um, some permitting authorities might have a little more experience with different agricultural control sources, um, and they might need less documentation than others to justify giving you that percent reduction. Um, we've been in discussions with our permitting group here in the headquarters office. Um, so we are going to also release a guidance along with the final um, emission models and um, AP42 chapter that kind of just relate um, already established permitting guidance to animal feeding operations and agriculture in general. Um, it's not uh, anything new. If you understand um, permitting already, it's um, all the same kind of thing. We're just putting it in the ag context, just to kind of reiterate how we think um, the definitions of like nearby or common ownership would apply to animal feeding operations, just to kind of help everyone sort out how all these calculations are gonna work for farms. Um, and that's on the limitations. My, I believe this is my last slide. Um, it's just a free um, hash, or at least um, the schedule is posted on our project website. If you want to um, look at it further, um, and it has the links directly to any of the um, previously released drafts there, if you want to check those out. Um, if you have any questions or if you have informal comments still, you can send them to me um, or to the name's email address. Um, and that is what I have.